So, so, um, so look, let, let, let me sort of back up and talk a little bit about the arc of the day before I introduce uh, uh, my, my friend here. We've been trying to look at the complexity of this wide set of issues that we might put under this heading of freedom to innovate. And we've looked at them from a legal point of view. We've looked at them in terms of some of the complexities and sort of interlocking rights. We've looked at it from a deeply personal point of view. And now what we're trying to do is really pivot and sort of ask the question, how might we make some progress on these issues? We are lucky in that we have a room full of student activists. We have a room full of activist lawyers. We have some very sympathetic folks from the academic community who want to do work around this. We have a lot of the ingredients of a potentially successful movement. We also have here, sitting to my right, a man who's going to complain about every aspect of how I characterize him, but I'm going to go do it anyway, which is I'm about to introduce you to Peter Suber, who has been one of the leading lights of what I consider to be one of the most successful movements to come out of the academic community in the last decade, which has been the movement towards open access publishing. And OA has managed to really transform uh, it, it, not so much the laws, but really the markets and the norms around intellectual property, around scholarly publishing. And a lot of it has had to do with Peter, both as an activist and a scholar and as a leader, because he's really been the chief documenter of the movement, first of all in a remarkable blog that he ran for many, many years, and now in his position over at Harvard University. So I asked Peter to join us because it's hard to build successful movements. It's particularly hard to build successful movements out of academic communities. And it's really helpful to have a hero who's sort of done this before. So with all that pressure sort of setting you up, I am now gonna have a conversation with Peter and uh, I'm already gonna tell him that he's not allowed to refuse my characterization of him. I was about to spend 20 minutes correcting you. Uh, I think it's mostly that it's upside down. Which is? The mic itself. Okay. <clears throat> we don't, I don't have a presentation planned. This is gonna be a, a Q and A. But I thought the topic was, uh, how do movements overcome legal obstacles in order to become successful? And I was going to start with an apology and say the movement to which I've de devoted myself was legal from the start, so I don't have any advice for the others. But I want to thank uh, Starr and Jeremy for their presentations, partly for the presentations themselves, for their experiences, but also for correcting my concept of the topic today. It's not enough, uh, that is, it's, uh, a movement doesn't have to be illegal from the start to uh, be relevant to our discussion. If it's perceived to be illegal, if it's misperceived to be illegal, if there are groundless objections to the legality of it, that's enough to halt it or to uh, create fear that slows everything down. And certainly the open access movement faced problems like that. Uh, I think it was legal from the start, but there's no doubt that lots of other people did not think so. Uh, and that included both proponents of open access and opponents of open access. I'd be happy to talk about the legal misunderstandings on both sides uh, that slowed us down. But with that <clears throat> frame, I'm happy to talk about it. We had a lot of experience overcoming those obstacles. So, so before we do anything else, not everyone here is going to be familiar with the term open access. Yep. Give us the compact definition of open access yep. and to save the question that I'm going to take as a follow-up, why is this so important at this particular moment in scholarship? Yep. Uh, Open access means free online research, where free is used in two senses, uh, free of charge and free of needless copyright and licensing restrictions. Uh, that is both gratis and Libra. <coughs> uh, free uh, for people to read if they have an internet connection, but also free for them to use and reuse without seeking permission or making any extra payments. It's desirable, it's urgent uh, today for the same reasons it was in the early days. Uh, Research tends to be done at great expense by people who uh, are paid to do it, who don't get royalties for publishing it, uh, who would not be harmed by giving it away, but who nevertheless give it away to journals who lock it up and charge for access, and who charge prices that exceed inflation by three or four times over three or four decades. So we've reached a crisis in which libraries, even wealthy academic libraries, cannot afford to buy all the research needed by their faculty and students, even though it's done by their faculty and students and by similar faculty and students elsewhere. 
so the volume of uh, research being done and the volume being published is growing steadily, but the prices are growing too. So you've broken the back of libraries. Libraries have to cancel uh, journals every year for budgetary reasons alone, uh, which limits the access of the people affiliated with that institution. The high prices have already, generally speaking, uh, killed off individual subscriptions. Uh, when I was a grad student, I individually subscribed to a handful of journals because they were in my area. I wanted to track them, but uh, they're completely unaffordable today, and that's true more or less across the board. So the only way most people get access to research is if they're lucky enough to be at an institution that's wealthy enough to subscribe to the journals that matter to you. Uh, and the number of people in that category is getting smaller and smaller, while the volume of research is getting larger and larger. So this research is, on the whole, funded by public money, uh, and as I say, written by people who voluntarily give it away, and yet it's locked up where very few people have access to it. Uh, that's a huge mistake. You could call it a market mistake or policy mistake, but uh, it's hindering our ability to learn what is already known and then to use what is already known. But, but Peter, if, if publishers can't charge stunning amounts of money for subscriptions to academic journals, how can they possibly do all that important editorial work yeah. that they do, ensuring that our scholarship is up to snuff? Yeah. Because everyone knows that professional editors are the key to making sure that we have a successful scholarly journal. Right. Uh, thanks for that question. Um, <laughs> uh, authors give away their work to journals, and peer reviewers who evaluate the work for its quality give away their time and labor. And on the whole, editors who evaluate the reports of peer reviewers also give away their time and labor. All the essential expert judgment that goes into making a journal good is donated by academics. Uh, so these journals get their raw ingredients free of charge. And therefore, we don't have to provide open access to unrefereed or non-peer reviewed research, which would be second best. We can provide open access to peer reviewed research because all the players would lose nothing by giving it away, because they're already giving it away. And this was true 350 years ago when science journals were invented, but they had to be in print, print was expensive, the, those who provided it had to recoup their costs. All of this changed with the advent of the internet. So all of the players in uh, scholarship had an interest in sharing their work as widely as possible, but suddenly they had the means to share it as widely as possible, and the open access movement is all about seizing that opportunity and fighting against those who want to stop us from seizing that opportunity. So um, give us sort of a landscape of what the, the open access publishing movement looks like at this point. This is something that um, as recently as 10 years ago was uh, something of an edge case uh, yep. in terms of the academic field. Now at this point, uh, there are numerous highly respected peer reviewed journals, uh, including some that I know that people in this room publish in, uh, that are open access journals. Give us a sense both for what are some of the highlights in that space and, and also maybe a little bit of, of financially how those journals work. Yeah. Uh, first, there are roughly two ways to make peer-reviewed research open access. Uh, one is to publish in a journal which is itself open access. So conventional journals, traditional journals, were not open access. They charged a subscription fee. Uh, you could call that an access fee. You had to pay to read the piece. Uh, but there's a new generation of journals called open access journals. They're free to start with. So uh, if you have an internet connection, you can read their full contents online without paying a thing. Uh, those, generally speaking, are new, new in the age of the internet. The earliest ones we can find are roughly early 90s, even though we had an internet and a web before that. Uh, there were non-peer reviewed uh, newsletters and things like that before then, but the first peer reviewed journals to take advantage of the internet to provide open access were in the early 90s. Uh, so long ago, there were just a handful. Today, there are over 10,000, 10,000 peer-reviewed open access journals. Uh, the other way to make peer-reviewed work open access is to uh, publish in any journal you like, including those that are not open access. Take a copy of the peer-reviewed manuscript, the one that's most useful to other scholars, and put it in what's called an open access repository. The repository itself does not provide peer review, but it can distribute peer-reviewed work. The trick here is to avoid copyright infringement, uh, and we'll talk about that. But it's a second way to do it. The advantage, one advantage, is that it frees the author to publish anywhere they like. And very often for career points, they have to publish in high prestige journals. Uh, high prestige journals get to be high prestige by having decades or even a century and more of uh, publishing history. They're venerable, and therefore they're not 
uh, open access. Open access journals, on the whole, are new, and new journals have a much harder time in creating a reputation, especially a reputation commensurate with their quality. They could be first rate from birth, but they're not high prestige from birth. That takes time. That's a sociological fact. Uh, so if you have career reasons to publish in a conventional journal, you can still take the peer-reviewed manuscript and put it in an open repository. So everybody, regardless of their career interests, regardless of where they choose to publish, can make their work open access one way or the other. Now to get to the progress point, we've got over 10,000 peer-reviewed open access journals today. And there are over 4,000 open access repositories uh, around the world. They break down into two categories. There are disciplinary repositories that try to collect all the work from a certain discipline. You may know about the archive with a Greek chi in the middle uh, at Cornell. Started out at the Los Alamos National Lab. Uh, it's actually uh, a wonderful success story for open access because it started in 1991, which is ancient in internet time. Uh, it moved to Cornell a couple years ago. Uh, it specializes in uh, physics, mathematics, computer science, and a few other disciplines. Almost all the work in those fields finds its way to the archive. And then there are institutional repositories. MIT has one, Harvard has one, and roughly 4,000 other schools around the country have them. And they try to collect the research output of one institution. So one way or another, you can deposit your work in a disciplinary repository or an institutional repository uh, and make it open regardless of where you publish. Uh, and this 4,000 number, by the way, I think is another success story. Uh, repositories are, generally speaking, based on open source software, but it's non-trivial to configure them and to maintain them, and you need a staff. Uh, it's an investment, uh, not only of a uh, little bit of money for the staff, but also of energy and uh, commitment to uh, launch one of these things and maintain it for the long term. But we've already seen that uh, globally. It's in the global north, it's in the global south. Uh, it collects work in the sciences and the humanities. In the beginning, I have to say, people thought the cost of maintaining a repository would be very, very low. One of the first universities to publish the numbers of how much it cost was Caltech. And at the time, the model was, all this is is a database that uh, is connected to the internet, and it distributes these works uh, to anybody who logs in, or anybody who uh, surfs over and clicks on a URL. All we need is a server sitting on a table, and we count on the authors to do all the depositing themselves, so there's no labor involved from the institution. And they said it cost them $1,000 <coughs> to run the repository for the whole school. And I'm sure that was true. They weren't lying. But repositories now are much more sophisticated. They do much more. They have more staff to do things for them, which we could talk about. But basically, they're much more expensive now. But despite the fact that they're more expensive, they have spread. <coughs> and one reason they've spread is that they solve the other half of the problem. There are open access journals for those who choose to publish in them, but open access repositories are complementary because they provide open access for those who don't publish in them uh, and who are compelled for uh, career reasons uh, to avoid them. So um, MIT has DSpace, which yep. is a lovely uh, open access repository. Uh, and clearly, given the fact that we're all in this business uh, to ensure that knowledge is available to as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, since MIT has made commitments like edX, the idea that we're going to try to make our classes available to people online, since we have folks like Raphael Rafe standing up and saying that we're not just trying to teach people on campus, but, but trying to enlighten people all over the world, uh, I, I assume that 99.9% uh, .9 of papers published by MIT professors are, are within DSpace, right? Yeah. Uh MIT has a policy, and Harvard has a policy, and many, many other schools, roughly 400 schools have a policy requiring their faculty to deposit new scholarly articles, a certain version of new scholarly articles, in the repository. Uh, it's hard to get to the point where a faculty has agreed to adopt such a policy. It's even harder, however, to implement these policies. Uh, at uh, Harvard, let me speak about that because I know the, the numbers better. Uh, we had nine schools. We had to adopt nine policies separately with nine separate votes. But several of the votes were unanimous, <coughs> including the vote from the law school faculty. So if you have any doubts about the legality, just take that, and that answers your questions. But it only means that they voted for the policy. And the policy has certain benefits that we can talk about. However, it's the requirement to deposit which uh, is hard to implement. Uh, technically, I suppose the faculty voted for a policy that is mandatory. Uh, it does require a deposit. It could be enforced through some kind of coercion or compulsion. But we don't do that. I don't know of any uh, school that does that because of academic freedom and because tenured professors can ignore uh, any attempt to enforce that kind of policy. So we use the mandatory language in our policy simply as a baseline expectation. 
or a commitment. Uh, our policies, like the MIT policies, were voted by faculty. They were not imposed by the administration top down. So when faculty vote for this, they are committing themselves to deposit. And when the occasion arises, we can remind them. Uh, the faculty voted for this. There is a standing commitment. But on the whole, our ability to implement the policies doesn't rest on the language of the policy, but it rests on things like persuasion, uh, education, uh, assistance. We actually help them deposit if, that, if they need help. Uh, diplomacy. <clears throat> uh, sometimes it's awkward or confrontational to ask somebody to deposit something if they feel that they're too busy uh, and they don't want to be nagged. We have to keep track of how often we've nagged people and uh, you know, put them on a do not disturb list after a while. Uh, it's that difficult. and it's, There are very few schools well, let me put it another way. Uh, when schools adopt such a policy, they see their deposit rate start to climb, but uh, it climbs toward a high number very slowly. Uh, and you can say you're making progress as long as the curve is sloping upwards, and our curve is sloping upwards, MIT's is sloping upwards, everyone I know is sloping upwards, but it's very hard to uh, jump to 80%, 90%, or 100%. Uh, let me tell you one of my favorite uh, incentives in order to boost the deposit rate to a high number. Uh, at the University of Liège, the rector is named Bernard Rentier. <clears throat> and because it's a European university that's more or less governed from the top down, and because he's an enlightened despot, he said when a faculty member comes up for promotion and tenure and they want the promotion and tenure committee to review any journal, journal articles that they've written in the past couple of years, the committee will only review the ones that are on deposit in the repository. It's beautiful because it doesn't change the promotion and tenure standards. It doesn't change where faculty are allowed to publish. It simply says, if you want us to read the darn things, put them in the repository and make them open access. Uh, another way to put it, we have an interest in seeing that you do good work, and we'll give you the signal about that during promotion and tenure. But we also have an interest in seeing you make your work accessible to other people. And we do that through this rule. Uh, their deposit rate is close to 100%. And it's fair to say no university comes close to that unless they have a similar policy. And there are not that many. There are about a dozen institutions around the world that have a policy like that. Uh, it's almost impossible in the US because we have much more bottom-up or faculty governance, and faculty won't impose this on themselves. But we're trying something similar at Harvard in a few departments. Instead of having a hard and fast rule that says the committee will ignore any work that's not in the repository, uh, we simply try to introduce an incentive into the, uh, call it the faculty mentoring process or advising process. So if a department says to its junior faculty, you're coming up for promotion and tenure next fall, let us recommend some ways that you can prepare for promotion and tenure. Uh, get your website in order so it's accurate and up to date. Uh, identify some external colleagues who can write letters for you. Uh, put all your recent articles in the repository, uh, and then four other things. So it's one item in a list, but you know it gets the attention of the candidate who wants to do everything on the list. So it's not a requirement. Uh, it is a recommendation. It's a recommendation for the best of reasons. There's something cynical or deceptive about it. Uh, the department really wants that to happen. Uh, the policy is already in effect at the school. The, de the department is simply saying, we endorse the policy. We want to do our part to help make it happen. And uh, good news, two departments at Harvard have already done this. We can't do it university-wide because Harvard doesn't do anything university-wide. Uh, MIT might be able to do that. Some other schools might be able to do that. I recommend it. But it's an example of using incentives where you cannot use compulsion or where you wouldn't want to use compulsion. So um, it, it's sometimes hard to get a sense for just how much OA has actually changed reality mm -hmm. over the course of about a decade. I mean, literally, we're talking about a landscape where as recently as 10 years ago, people who were concerned about their tenure and promotion prospects were for the most part publishing in journals that can have access fees that are well into the five figures per year, um, that are inaccessible to all but the biggest universities out here. We are now within this decade to the point where you have big prestigious universities essentially telling faculty, you are required to make your publications accessible open access. And by the way, if you'd like to get tenure, you probably ought to take this as a first step. Yes. Peter, I want you to talk about the even crazier aspect of your reality distortion field here, which has had to do with US government funding <coughs> yeah. and open access. Yeah. Uh, the first federal agency in the US to have an open access policy was the NIH, the National Institutes of Health. And it was also one of the first funding agencies in the world. It 
almost had a policy in 2004, which would have made it the first public funding agency with a policy, but because of lobbying, it was delayed. It adopted a policy in 2005 that was heavily diluted by this lobbying, and the 2005 version was a mere recommendation or request. By 2008, the same policy became mandatory. So that's when the policy became strong, and by then it was no longer the first. But the NIH policy was very progressive for its day. Uh, it simply said if you take an NIH grant to do your research, then you must make any articles reporting that research open access. Must was in the policy. Uh, and of course, remember, this is public money. So the background principle is if you take public money to do research, you owe the results back to the public. And we will see to it as the public's agent here. Uh, if you, uh, by the way, it had one more important qualification. If you go to publish the article based on your research, you must retain the rights to authorize open access. Uh, don't just sign anything the publisher puts in front of you. Uh, you must modify the contract to retain the right to authorize open access. And if the publisher that you want to publish with does not let you do that, you must go to a different publisher. So there were several musts in there that were very strong. And uh, it was that strength that made it progressive. Uh, lots of publishers hated the idea. As I said, they've been lobbying against it for years. They finally lost. And the NIH is so large that publishers were forced to accommodate it. They could have ignored it. That is, they have a right, an absolute right, to refuse to publish NIH-funded authors. Uh, and by the way, I want them to have that right. I don't want any publisher to be forced to publish anything. Uh, they could have exercised it, but they didn't because NIH is so large. Uh, how large is it? Well, it's five times bigger than the second biggest funding agency in the United States, which is the NSF. Uh, its budget this year is $30 billion. Uh, the amount of that devoted to research is larger than the GDP of 40 countries. Uh, it, its money funds roughly 80,000 peer-reviewed papers every year. So publishers who wanted to uh, resist <clears throat> would have had to refuse to publish a huge volume of very high quality research. They couldn't bear to do that. They caved or they accommodated it. And now, almost every publishing contract says, you may not make your work open access unless you were funded by the NIH. So that's a kind of victory. Uh, on the other hand, NIH is only one funding agency, and we'd like to see the same sort of thing done in all the others. Uh, lots of others have adopted similar policies in the meantime, but because they don't carry the weight of the NIH, these clauses don't yet appear in those contracts, and they have to be either negotiated individually or uh, done by virtue of the NIH-style policy where you say, I have to retain these rights or I can't publish with you. Uh, and so the world is changing slowly. But the NIH was a huge leap ahead, uh, not only by requiring open access, but by requiring the retention of rights to authorize open access. Uh, if it weren't for that, these funded researchers would have had to publish in open access journals. Not a bad thing, but only 30% of peer-reviewed journals are open access, and you would have forced them to limit their choices to those 30. Uh, if a university did that, we would call it a violation of academic freedom. I'm not sure we would say the same thing if a funding agency said it, but NIH did not want to say that. It wanted to allow them to publish anywhere, provided they retained the relevant rights. But since then, funding agencies, public funding agencies in uh, every part of the world have adopted similar policies. And when I say every part of the world, I, just, I don't mean uh, high research output countries. Uh, and the highest research output regions are North America and Europe. But we see policies like this in every continent except Antarctica. Uh, and it works everywhere. And more and more funding agencies see the logic of it. And the logic of it, in short, is uh, we're spending public money. We ought to do it in the public interest. Uh, the public interest is not to fund important research and then let it be funneled into uh, a journal that locks it up and forces people to pay, especially forces taxpayers to pay again to take a look at it. The same logic applies to private foundations. And at the same time, the NIH adopted its policy, which was a public agency spending public money. The Wellcome Trust in England adopted a similar policy, and it's a private funder. It's roughly speaking the Gates Foundation of the UK. It's the largest funder of medical research in the UK. Uh, and it was on board very early with this, and it had the same terms. If you take our money, we're a private charity. We only give money for charitable purposes. We don't want it locked away where nobody can see it. You must make it open access, and you must retain the rights to make it open access. And if you uh, want to publish somewhere that won't let you do that, find a different publisher, period, the end. Otherwise, you don't get our money. And those players, the NIH and Wellcome Trust, really changed the game. Uh, I have to say, not all newer policies are as good as those two, uh, but some of them are even better. So here's a deeply disruptive idea. 
It's an idea that's challenging to the business models of some well-established players. Um, it's a radical and new idea when it comes uh, out within academic communities and out within publishing communities. Literally over the course of 10 to 15 years, it's now become a mainstream idea to the point where 30% of peer-reviewed journals are open access. There's an incredible choice of it. Universities have mandatory policies uh, requiring deposit and open access repositories. The largest funder of research in the US and in the UK both require publishing under these terms. Yeah. By the way, uh, I can add, NIH is the largest funder in the world if you don't count classified military research. It's by far the largest in the world. And you're saying the classified military research has not yet subscribed to OA. That's right. Exactly. So <laughs> what I want to know, sort of returning to some of the language earlier today, is, is whether or not you're a witch. Uh, by, by which I mean, how the hell did you guys pull this off, Peter? Um, it's hard to answer that question because there isn't one thing. Uh, it was many things over many years by many people. And I was one of the people, but uh, it's not something any one person did. Uh, I was thinking earlier about how to frame the talk. Some of the lessons learned in the open access movement would not apply to some of the speakers earlier today who are representing one project or one startup uh, because you don't have enough bandwidth to do all the different things required or all the different things that we did. Uh, we were a movement and a movement has enough people to use the division of labor to do different things. And if I have a recommendation, it's to fight on all fronts at once, to recognize what the fronts are uh, and let people set their own priorities. Uh, let me just give you an example. I mentioned there are two ways to provide or distribute open access through repositories and through journals. Within the open access movement, there's some disagreement about which one of those is better. Uh, some people thought that disagreement was harmful to the movement. I didn't. I just thought it was division of labor at work. Let the people who think repositories are most important work hard on getting repositories launched and filled. Let the people who think journals are more important work on getting journals launched and filled. Uh, and the fact that we had different people working on different fronts at the same time was hugely beneficial. But that took multiple people. It took uh, enough people working on each front to make some progress there. Uh, and likewise, uh, to go back to lobbying for a sec, uh, a lot of what we did uh, took advantage of the fact that U.S. copyright law allows copyright holders to transfer their rights by contract. So we had to uh, create incentives for researchers to transfer their rights in better ways rather than worse ways. Uh, that's one front. But another front was simply to change copyright law. And changing copyright law is very difficult, uh, especially to change it in a good way as opposed to a bad way. Uh, and we had the bandwidth. We had the people. We had people who could focus their time lobby in Congress to amend uh, not necessarily copyright law, but the other statutes that were getting in our way and uh, after amendment would help us. And other people working on contract incentives or other incentives to uh, use your rights more wisely. Uh, and without lots of people working on lots of fronts at the same time, we would not have made the progress we did. So it's not a modest answer. It's literally true. Uh, this was done by a huge group of people. And at the beginning of the movement, we didn't have a huge group, so that was one of the hardest things to do. Uh, I even remember in the earliest days when there were just five or ten of us who were talking about this in public and speaking about it at meetings, uh, it kind of wore me out. And I thought one criterion for success in the open access movement will be when there are 200 people who can talk about this at meetings instead of just uh, 20 people. <clears throat> uh, by the way, we passed that you know, milestone a long time ago, and now there are 2,000 people who can talk about it. But it's very hard to start with a small group of people and make it a large group of people. The advantage we had was that this is a great idea. And sometimes I feel very lucky because I don't think there are any good objections to open access. Uh, there's no downside that I have to hide uh, or no compromise I have to make to minimize that. Uh, it's all good. I think every objection can be answered, period. Uh, give me time. I mean, I'll uh, give you the answer. But uh, I. Because it's that good and because people perceive it to be that good after they give it some attention, people join up, people sign on, people help out. Uh, and the message spread pretty naturally. Well, here's an anecdote. Uh, the publishers opposed this, uh, academic publishers. Uh, they opposed it bitterly at the beginning, uh, and they've changed a little bit because they see the writing on the wall. But when they were bitterly opposed to it, they hired a communications and lobbying firm to discredit the open access movement and to advance their own cause in Congress. And they spread lots of propaganda. 
Uh, they even said that open access to publicly funded research is a kind of censorship. Uh, it, it's hard to believe, it, it, it's hard to grok what they meant. Uh, and even now, I'm not sure what they meant. They seem to have meant uh, if the government is uh, not only funding their research, but also distributing their research, the government could, if it wanted to, refuse to distribute some of it. <coughs> uh, but what they didn't understand was the policy was you publish it first, and then the government hosts a copy and distributes the copy. So even if the government refused to distribute a copy, it still published somewhere. So there's no censorship. Anyway, that's the kind of uh, communications firm or PR firm that this was. And the letters between this communication firm and the publishing trade association that hired him were leaked. And so we got to see what they said among themselves in private. And one thing the lobbyist, the uh, PR firm, had to tell the group of publishers was, it's hard because their message is better than our message. So, so to unpack this a little bit, Peter, you had the incredible advantage that by the end, you have a huge group of folks who are able to work on many different aspects of this. And the folks who think that open access repositories are the way to go don't even necessarily have to agree with the folks who yeah. think that open access journals are the way to go. Those folks can be working on different aspects of it. Yeah. There is a question, of course, uh, of how you get to scale on that, and I want to ask that question. Another aspect of this is that you were right, uh, that at the end of the day, using public money to pay for intellectual property for companies to close this information off yeah. to the taxpayers who paid for it is literally insane. Yeah. But there's another piece of this, or maybe two or three pieces of this that, that I'd, I'd love for you to, to touch on. One is, is uh, how did we fund this? How did, um, how did people sort of come together to sort of build a movement around this? Uh, and then also, for all the folks working on different aspects of this, whether they were working on starting journals, whether they were working on pressuring the NIH, how did all those folks end up with a coherent sense of movement and vision out of this? Because I'm, I'm literally trying to squeeze you yeah. for as much knowledge as I can get before we as a group of people in this room try to sort of turn and, and, and do some of this around the issues that we've been talking about and, and, and exploring all day today. Yeah. Well, first on money. <clears throat> Uh, if you know much about open access, you've probably heard that open access journals charge a publication fee, or what's called an author processing charge, or an APC. It's true that some do, but the common understanding is that all of them do, and that's the only way they can pay their bills. That's not true. In fact, it's not even close to true. Not even most open access journals charge those kinds of fees. Only 30% of open access journals charge those fees. 70% of open access journals charge no fees. Obviously not at the reader side, because that would violate open access, but not even at the author side. Uh, they exist on subsidies, and there are different ways they can arrange those subsidies. But at the 30% that do charge fees, uh, this was a new model. A typical journal, a conventional non-open access journal, charges subscription fees, which means the readers have to pay, or institutions that represent readers, like libraries, have to pay. Uh, and they're breaking the backs or the budgets of libraries. So open access, some open access journals flipped that around and said, let's get the payment we need from the other end. Uh, even when they do that, some people think they're charging authors and asking authors to pay out of pocket. That's also not true. They send the bill to the author, but uh, roughly 88% of the time, the bill is paid by the author's employer, a university, or the author's grant, a funding agency. Only 12% of the time do authors pay out of pocket. Nevertheless, a common myth is that these are author pays journals, and that makes them look like vanity presses. Uh, not true, but it was easy for publishers to spin it so that this looked like vanity publishing. And, and by the way, even when authors pay out of pocket, it's not vanity publishing, because nothing should be called vanity publishing if it has peer review. Uh, but that's one way they pay the bills. They charge an article processing charge. The rationale for that is we do have expenses. It's not free to publish a journal, even though it's not as expensive as people think, because they get their raw ingredients free of charge. But if somebody can pay their costs up front, then they don't have to charge the end user anything. Uh, this may sound exotic, but it's exactly the same business model used by broadcast radio and broadcast television. Uh, there are a lot of expensive production costs. Uh, they could never uh, operate if they couldn't get those costs recovered, but they don't charge the end user. 
you can listen to radio, broadcast radio, and broadcast TV free of charge. It's because other people paid up front uh, to cover all those expenses completely. Uh, who does that in the case of TV and radio? It's usually advertisers. In the case of public TV, it's people of goodwill who make a donation. In the case of scholarship, it's universities and funding agencies. <clears throat> and it works perfectly well, uh, most of the time. Uh, the fee-based model for open access journals works best in fields that are well-funded, like medicine. Uh, medicine is probably the best funded of all the disciplines, and almost every open access journal in medicine uses this model. It's no problem for the authors because almost all medical research funders are willing to pay this fee, and they say so up front. This model is rarest in the humanities, where almost no research is funded. Uh, and every time a humanities organization wants to launch an open access journal, if they labor under this misunderstanding that you have to charge a fee, otherwise you can't do it, then they give up because they say, we could never get away with that. Our authors don't have the money to pay these fees. They need to learn more. Uh, there are other ways to do it. Uh, by the way, I maintain a list on a wiki of the business models used by different open access journals. And currently, it lists 15. So uh, fees are only one of 15 different models that are already in use, already attested. Uh, I mentioned that the no-fee journals use a uh, subsidy of some kind. There are many different sources of the subsidy. It can be uh, a nonprofit institution of some kind or another. Sometimes it's a funding agency. Sometimes it's a university. Sometimes a hospital or a museum. Uh, sometimes it's a consortium of organizations that want to see a high-quality peer-reviewed journal in some niche on some topic survive. And sometimes it's a single organization, but if you ask the organization, would you cover 100% of our expenses, it's often hard for them to say yes. But if you go to 10 organizations and say, would you pay a tenth of our expenses, it's often easy for them to say yes. And I've advised a couple startups uh, about how to do this, and they're generally successful. One of them asked me, uh, how do I respond to them if they say, what do they get in return? And I say, public thanks. That's all you can offer them. Uh, you are going to do a good job publishing peer-reviewed research in this area that they care about, and you're thanking them in public in every issue. Uh, that should be all the thanks that they want. They know they're not publishing a for-profit journal. They're publishing a non-profit journal. In fact, they're doing a public service by sharing their research with the whole world. And that works. Uh, any organization that's willing to make such a subsidy is willing to do it for nothing more than public thanks. Now, on the repository side, costs are a little different. Uh, as I said, Caltech said it could do this in the early days for $1,000 a year. Uh, that's not been true anywhere for a long time. But uh, it's not expensive to host a piece of software, especially open source software, on a university repository. Uh, the depositing can be done by faculty. And if they do, it's costless to the institution to just open the door and let faculty do that. But on the whole, faculty feel too busy and you need people to knock on the doors and uh, try to get these files. So you need to hire a couple people. You need somebody, some tech person, to configure the software, uh, not just to customize it for the institution and to build bridges to other pots of data around the campus, but also to uh, uh, welcome the crawlers of search engines. Google and Google Scholar, for example, want to index all of these open repositories. They want to index all open content everywhere for every purpose. Uh, but if you configure it badly, then you drive away their crawlers. Uh, so you need somebody who understands this and uh, can fix that uh, deterrent to the crawlers. So you need some tech help. You need some outreach help. And a repository, because it's open access or it provides open access to its contents, and because it's a general purpose database that allows easy deposit of new content, is a general purpose tool. And we recommended them for the sake of hosting scholarship, for the sake of other scholars elsewhere. But once they're built, all these constituents come out of the woodwork at a university and they say, well, can we put our digitized special collections in there? And again, why not? It's already there. It's a special tool for that purpose. Uh, can we put our university records in there and keep them dark? Uh, yes, why not? It's that kind of thing. Uh, so more and more people want to make use of it. The good news is there are more and more stakeholders on campus who want to see it survive. Uh, on the other side, it becomes more and more expensive because you need more and more staffers to take care of it. Uh, so it's a non-trivial expense at many schools. And to the credit of the schools that do this, that spend the money on it, they see it as an investment in a superior alternative. And the same goes for schools that have a fund to pay these fees at open access journals that charge fees. Uh, Harvard has such a fund. Uh, Hundreds of other schools have these funds, and this money had to come from somewhere else. They had to deny something in order to uh, create the fund. 
That too is an investment. So even in this period where library budgets are being squeezed by uh, hyperinflationary journal prices, they're finding money to invest in a superior alternative. So I, I'm hoping for folks who didn't understand why we had open access on the table here that it starts to become clear. For me, open access is just one of the, the single best examples of a successful battle mm -hmm. in this space, a successful movement that's managed to take a diverse group of folks who were united by a common idea, but had quite divergent approaches to figuring out how to bring it out into the world. Uh, Peter, I assume at this point that OA is such a success that everybody involved with the movement has retired to Hawaii? Yeah, I'm waiting for that. Uh, however, there was a moment a couple years ago when I realized we had reached a point where uh, I could retire. Uh, I don't want to make it sound like it was indispensable before, but I felt like I was playing a role that, uh, if not played by somebody, uh, would hinder things. Uh, and I knew that enough fires had been lit that they would stay burning and I could just go to Hawaii if I had the money to go to Hawaii. Uh, that's been true for a couple years, so this is very gratifying. There's a sort of self-igniting moment when a movement really takes off. Enough people understand it, enough people get it, enough people are working on enough different fronts that you know it's non-stoppable. And open access was non-stoppable several years ago. On the other hand, it's far from uh, the default. And to me, there's no single finish line for the open access movement, but uh, a quasi-finish line is when all new research is open access by default. And if there's some special reason not to make it open, then we change, uh, that is, that author or that publisher uh, can flip a switch and uh, take a different course. But by default, everything uh, new should be open. We're not there, we're not even close. Uh, or to put it another way, it's uneven. Uh, most medical research, I think, is now open by default because most medical uh, funders want to make it open. Uh, and the NIH took the lead on that. Uh, and the NIH funds most medical research together with Wellcome Trust, the Gates Foundation, uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute. All of these have open access policies. So they made sure of it. Physics on the whole is open access by default because the Cornell archive has been so terribly successful. Uh, by the way, it's a nice question for a sociological study or a dissertation sometime. Why physics before the other fields? Uh, I have some theories about that, but the fact is the disciplines are moving at different rates. Uh, physics moved fastest on open access repositories. Medicine moved fastest on open access journals. Uh, in a couple fields, I think we can now say new work is open by default, or more new work is open than not open. But in almost every other field, that's not true, so we're still climbing toward that plateau. Uh, last year, a published study showed that 50% of all the work uh, new research journal articles published since 2012 were open access in some way or another, that is, in a repository or in a journal, legally or illegally, they were just open. Uh, after a few years, doesn't mean they were open from birth, but after a couple years. But still, that 50% is an important marker. Uh, and by now, nobody's repeated the study, uh, I'm sure the number is higher. So you could say that's a tipping point or a crossover point. There'll be another one further ahead where I think we can say for every discipline, all new work is open by default. There are exceptions where people choose something other than the default, but if we can get that far, I think we can call it a day and have our victory party. So uh, let me say, as someone who studies social change for a living, um, truly successful revolutionaries are few and far between. Uh, I'm sitting next to one. Uh, for those of you who are interested in making change in the world around these issues, I highly recommend interrogating this man and getting his secrets, and we're gonna take a few moments to do just that, uh, starting with the gentleman in front here. Um, I've, I've got a Latanya Sweeney question, yep. I guess. Um, Latanya Sweeney actually, uh, her research sort of guest starred in the last presentation, so it's right. a shame she's not here. But, uh, a lot of the, the only problem I've ever heard about open access is the problem of data sets and de-anonymization, de um, things about sociology, um, some medical studies, yep. uh, that you could potentially take a study and reverse it to the participants. How do you handle, uh, how do you handle that? I yep. mean, you, are, you, are you putting, is there, I guess, is there an advantage to elitism? What's elitism here? Oh, not, not, not in open access. I mean, is there an advantage into the, the elitism of... Uh, is there an advantage to open access? access. Oh, I see. Closed access. Uh, I never heard that called elitism. Uh, 
closure or uh, privateering. Uh, <clears throat> but first of all, I was talking mostly about open access to texts, not data. And in particular, open access to journal articles. Much of the logic carries over to open access to data. Uh, one reason open access to journal articles is low-hanging fruit is that the authors are not paid for them. Ditto, authors are not paid for their data sets. <clears throat> so they could give them away without losing anything. Uh, however, uh, authors, once we get them alone for five minutes, see the logic of this and they want to make their work open. However, most researchers who generate data sets, shouldn't say most, many researchers who generate data sets, even after this five minute talk, don't see the logic. Uh, there are reasons why they themselves resist. For example, you make a large data set and somebody asks you to make it freely available. You've published one article on it, but you'd rather publish 10 before you give away your data. You don't want to be scooped on your own data by other people. Uh, I think that's a legitimate interest. Um, you, um, the data needs annotation. Suppose your data takes the form of a spreadsheet and the columns are not labeled. They're just full of numbers. You know what the columns stand for. Uh, nobody else will. And you would be embarrassed to share it with people who found it inscrutable. Or at least you'd say, what's the point of sharing it if it's inscrutable? <coughs> uh, I would need a year to annotate it. And I don't have a year to annotate it. I'm moving on to my next project. So that's a common objection. Another objection is medical privacy, as you say. And lots of people, including me, I have to say, think medical privacy comes first. Uh, and if your data contains confidential information about human subjects, you can't make it open, at least not without consent. Uh, another objection is that the data set is simply titanic. Uh, some data sets in astronomy are so big that you cannot download them. Even if they were online in a place that permitted downloading, you couldn't download them. Uh, I don't know if you remember, Google had a solution to this for a while. Uh, it, said if, uh, it said to generators of huge data sets, if you are willing to make the whole data set open, we will ship you a package of hard drives and put your data on the hard drives and we will share it with anybody who makes a request for it, provided you let us let it pass through Google on the way and we'll make our own copy. <coughs> and it was a pretty good deal to most people. There's no you know, privacy invasion here uh, with astronomy data. But uh, it, it didn't work out in the end. But Google said, we would pay all the expenses. We'll buy the hard drives. We'll pay the postage. Uh, but we still face that problem. Uh, even as bandwidth gets larger, data sets are getting larger faster than that. So for all these reasons, open data has not gone quite as far as open text, except for those who voluntarily make their data open. Many of the funding agencies that require open access to published texts want open access to data, and they look very hard for some way to do the comparable thing. But they end up with something very weak, I have to say. It's usually called a data management plan. Instead of saying, you must make your data open, they say, you must have a plan on how to share your data with those who need it. And from their point of view, the plan could be, we won't. That's a plan. <clears throat> Another plan would be, uh, if they sign certain forms about non-disclosure, uh, then we'll share it with them. Uh, but there are all kinds of things you could put into your plan. And data sets differ so much from one another that this flexibility helps. On the other hand, it's far short of the requirement that we see elsewhere. Uh, the other advantage of open data is that it's not copyrightable, or let's put it another way, most data sets are not copyrightable. If you're in the social sciences and your data consists of taped interviews with people, that's copyrightable, probably. Uh, but when data is uncopyrightable, like a column of numbers, uh, then there's no copyright barrier to overcome. And most data sets are never published, so there are no publishers trying to stand in the way. The chief uh, obstacle, the people who are standing in the way, are the authors themselves, unfortunately. So we've got time for uh, maybe one or two more questions here. We go over here. Um, so I was reading, I'm, there's probably someone here read about it more recently than me, but like maybe last week or so, two weeks ago about this thing with Wikipedia where a practice that had existed for a while um, just started getting talked about more in the media and the blogosphere about how Wikipedia like has citations that are open access and many that aren't and that there's also um, special agreements where journals identify people who are prolific editors of Wikipedia, especially in science zones of Wikipedia, and give them special access to journals so that they then use those articles as citations in Wikipedia articles, but then people reading Wikipedia can't see the citations, so it kind of defeats the purpose of it. Yeah. And 
I mean, my knee jerk reaction is like, Wikipedia should only use open access, but I'm sure it's more complicated than that. I would yeah, assume it is more complicated. What do you think they should do? Uh, here's the story, first of all, so everybody knows it. Elsevier, which is a large non open access publisher, generally non open access, with a few exceptions, uh, was approached by Wikipedia itself. It was Wikipedia's idea, Wikimedia Foundation's idea, to approach Elsevier and ask, would you give some Wikipedians access to all of your non-open access journal content so that they can improve Wikipedia? Uh, they'll do research in your articles that are otherwise closed and uh, add knowledge from your articles to Wikipedia. This same request went to many other publishers, and most publishers said yes. Elsevier said yes. Elsevier is not just uh, non-open access, it's notoriously non-open access. It's uh, sort of the, the Disney of uh, <coughs> Uh, academic publishing. The Death Star. Yeah. My, my words, not Peter's. So when this spread, uh, there was much more controversy than there was for the other publishers who said yes. And the argument was uh, Wikipedia is giving them something free of charge, namely brand recognition, uh, links to their articles, citations that actually count to uh, improve the credibility of those journals, uh, but getting nothing in return. Uh, and first of all, they are getting something in return. The articles are better. At least we hope they're better. And if they're not better, it's the Wikipedians' fault. It's not Elsevier's fault. Uh, however, it's tough because I don't want Wikipedia to link to articles that simply give the user a paywall. I want Wikipedia users who click on a footnote to go straight to the full text. Uh, there's a dilemma here. Some people are already saying, actually 10 years ago, some people were already saying, if a piece of research is not open access, it's not worth reading. That was false then, I think it's false today. It'll be false for a long time. It won't always be false, and I'm working for the day when it's actually true, but it's still false today. So if the knowledge you need to improve a Wikipedia article is only published in a non-open access journal, and you happen to read the article, uh, and you want to share that knowledge through Wikipedia, and you have permission, uh, you should link to the article that gave you the knowledge. That's good scholarship. If you don't link to it, you're deceiving people. That's true. On the other hand, uh, it's worth trying, but most of the time Elsevier would say no. Uh, but again, worth trying. Uh, so first of all, I wouldn't refuse to use Elsevier articles just because they're not open access. Uh, that's like refusing to learn something because it's not open access. Uh, you should use it when you can. Uh, there's some controversy uh, in, separately before this case ever came up about whether you should link to the publisher's version of an article, which might not be open and gives the user a paywall, or a link to an open version of the article, which might be illicit and uh, illegal. Uh, if it exists, shouldn't we do that? Somebody even proposed that the uh, purpose of a footnote is to uh, help the user follow through on what you just said in the article. Uh, and if they don't believe you, or if they want to read more deeply about what you just said, they just go right through. And for that purpose, Clicking to an open version of the article is better than clicking to a non-open version, even if the publisher version was non-open. Uh, I think that's a nice idea, uh, nice in the legal sense. It's, uh, uh, there are good arguments for it, good arguments against it. it. We all should be thinking about that. To me, that's the question raised by this Wikipedia controversy. Uh, I want Wikipedia articles to be as good as possible. I'm glad publishers are letting Wikipedians read their non-open access content. Uh, I'm glad those, that knowledge is being used to improve Wikipedia. But all in all, I think I would prefer it if the Wikipedians linked to open versions of those articles when there were open versions. But we should all admit going in, there aren't always open versions of those articles. And when there aren't, scholarly honesty requires us to link to the other versions. Because if you don't do that, you're not giving proper credit. Do we have a final question? Uh, yeah, so I think this is a perfect audience because we got you and then all these lawyers to answer this question. I'm a lawyer um, too, by the way. Sorry. Oh, okay, great. Okay. Uh, so, so fair use. All right. So I've I've always thought that, like the copyright like claims on these articles are all kind of deceptive because for uh, copyright is circumventable for scholarly and research under fair use, right? So like, uh, well, okay, that was my not without qualification. You can do oh. certain things with a piece of published scholarship uh, and call it fair use and be justified, but you can't do everything with a piece of scholarship. You can't reprint it and distribute it to the whole world, for example. That's not fair use. Even if it's a bunch of researchers? 
If who's a bunch of researchers? Uh, the, the, it, um, it's a researcher sharing it with researchers. No, right? uh, so, again, if you reprint the full text and share it with the whole world, which means researchers and non-researchers, it's not fair use. Even if you shared it with just researchers around the world, it's probably not fair use. Uh, it's also controversial whether even sharing it with a full classroom of students is fair use, even though classroom use is in the legislative history about fair use, and that's supposed to be a paradigm case of fair use. Uh, we've been, we become squeamish about that, and it's not clear whether it's fully fair, uh, fully permissible. But certainly sharing it with the whole wide world is not fair use. So the kind of open access I'm talking about, where you share it with literally everybody who has an internet connection, cannot be supported through fair use. You have to go beyond that. And that's one reason why so many open access journals and repositories and individual authors use open licenses, like Creative Commons licenses, because they grant rights that users don't already have through fair use. Uh, if fair use sufficed, we wouldn't need open licenses. The, the, there, there's a battalion of IP lawyers over here, and I can just sort of watch them, you know, you know, coming to life. But at the same time, we have Cory Doctorow over here with a hand up. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm going to let Cory weigh in, yeah. and, and, and the battalion of lawyers can come to my this rescue. This is a good one for the lawyers, too. Until pretty recently, like a couple of decades ago, it was standard for university faculty to sign work made for hire agreements with their employers. Yeah. And yet it was the faculty who signed the assignments of copyright to the academic publishers whose material is behind the paywall. Yes. They weren't in a position to sign those agreements because they weren't the rights holders to them. Doesn't that make everything behind the paywall, with some exceptions from the last couple of decades, presumptively infringing? And therefore, the publishers have no standing to seek a copyright infringement claim against people who extract those documents or share them. Yep. Only the universities could. Uh, it's a good point. Uh, it's true that at the time, work for hire was widely used. Authors signed these contracts, not universities. And the university is the copyright holder. It should have been the one to sign. So the publishers never got the rights from the copyright holder. Therefore, it had no rights. And in principle, you could sue about that. Nobody's done it. So it's an opportunity for somebody who wants to give it a try. Uh, that's right. Uh, so universities could uh, harvest all these papers back from the online versions of the journals and just say the journal never had the rights to begin with. Uh, Sue me. Uh, nobody's tried that. But again, that's an opportunity. Uh, there was a similar, uh, by the way, I think there's a, a good argument for that. Even if it's too late for it to succeed in a real court, uh, I still think it's a good argument. Uh, but just to finish the story, most universities have not changed their work for hire policies, but they have almost deliberately ignored them. So uh, Harvard, for example, does not assert work for hire over scholarship. Uh, and I. I don't know how much detail I gave about the Harvard policy, which is also like the MIT policy, but the Harvard authors, Harvard faculty vote to give Harvard the rights to distribute their work through the open access repository. And that grant of rights from the authors to the institution presupposes that there's no work for hire. It's a way of saying, we own the rights, we authors, and we're now granting them to you, uh, or at least non-exclusive rights, uh, so you can distribute this work. And if work for hire were still strong, authors wouldn't have to do that. Universities could provide open access on their own because they already have all the relevant rights. Uh, we found that politically, it was much easier to get these policies adopted if we could uh, show people that they presuppose that there is no university work for hire and that the rights belong to you, the faculty member, and we're asking you uh, voluntarily to grant a certain subset of those uh, to the university for these purposes. Uh, scholars like that. And the fact is, it's true that we're asking them to do it voluntarily. It's true that the university never asserted work for hire anymore, not for decades. Uh, and it's true that the result is faculty get back more rights than they had before. Uh, I didn't mention this either, but when the university gets all these rights by virtue of the policy, it gives them back to the faculty member. Uh, because the policy says, not only can you use these rights your own way, but you have the right to give them to other people, including the authors. So authors get back more rights over their own work than they got from their own publishing contract. <clears throat> so it leaves them in a much better spot. And authors who understood that uh, tend to like it a lot. They say, first of all, I never liked work for hire. I'm glad that you're asking me as if I were the rights holder. And I'm glad I'm getting more rights back than I had before. So we're going to close the session here. Can we get a round of applause for yeah. Peter? This is incredibly helpful. Yeah.
Um, we're going to take one of our patented 12-minute breaks. Uh, we're going to be back here uh, in front of the lights, uh, which feel to me like the setting sun, uh, at approximately 4.20 p.m. so that Nathan Matias and Kate Darling can talk about the remarkable work that they've led uh, as far as uh, work within MIT. And then we're going to move into a closing discussion of what we might be doing as far as building student movements. So see you back in roughly 10-ish minutes. Thanks. Thank you.